This project is very meaningful to me because not only did I learn a lot about myself as a collaborator, um, I also learned a lot about other people and the way their processes, their creative processes are. We created something that I couldn't possibly come up on my own. In order to, to be yourself, you actually have to have a right kind of environment. For me, it's all about the people I'm working with, really. And the two of you sort of allowed me to be vulnerable and uh, meticulous and... You know, I first met Emily Ko in October 2016 in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, she came to a show that I was doing with my saxophone duo Oni Suono, and my duo partner Phil, he introduced us and I just remember Emily being this bubbly, fun, and just extremely enthusiastic person. And she really stuck in my mind and I also just, I wanted to get to know her a little bit better. I listened to her music and we stayed in touch. And then a few months later, as I was starting to think about people I wanted to collaborate with in the near future, she was at the top of my list. So I sent her a message and I was just like, hey, Emily, I really want to work with you. I'm thinking about doing a multimedia solo project. Would you be interested in that? Emily is always very quick to respond and she immediately messaged me back and said she was interested and she settled on doing a multimedia project for me. In May, so a couple months later, Emily thought, you know, maybe I shouldn't be the one to do the video for this piece. That's not something I've done. And at the time, I pretty quickly thought of my friend Michiko Saiki. Well, first of all, Michiko and I went to school together. She had become a good friend of mine after a couple years at Bowling Green State University. I was doing my doctorate in contemporary music and Michiko was working on her master's in piano and then stayed for her doctorate in contemporary music. But in addition to working on, on her music, Michiko was getting into video art and performance art. She had gotten quite good and I really loved her work. So I thought of her for this project because I also thought um, she would get along well with Emily and it would be fun to have the three of us collaborating. <laughs> a few months later in September is when we really started to solidify the theme a little bit more. I, I had already known that I wanted to explore themes of social justice and that stemmed from a few different things but primarily from the 2016 presidential election. So I was interested in exploring current events, social justice themes, and this general idea of human connection or connectivity or lack thereof in our society. I had pitched that to Emily and she spent some time thinking about it and by September had decided that she wanted to represent voices that had been smothered or otherwise not heard. So voices that were suppressed in our society or, or in the world overall. That theme sort of turned into this idea of immigration and the new immigration ban put into place in 2017. Um, so when Noah said to write, uh, or to think about a piece regarding human connection, it didn't really take me long to decide on the topic of immigration. Those days, I, I remember feeling really scared and voiceless uh, during the early hours of um, the executive order. 13769, uh, today we know that as the travel ban. So that time, some legal immigrants and U.S. citizens were barred from entering the U.S. And um, as a legal immigrant here, I thought that it was really unfair because, you know, all the things that I've done to, to build my life here, everything that I worked so hard for um, could be taken away from me in an instant um, through no fault of my own. And uh, it just seemed really unfair, unjust, and I you know, just didn't really know how to feel back then. So I decided that I wanted to write something about immigration. <sighs> 
Noah and Emily told me that they are interested in the theme of immigration and travel ban, but the more I thought about it, it became more difficult for me to take the perspective of immigrants, as someone who has this privilege of being Japanese. After moving to Germany, I became friends with several refugees who do not have the same privilege as I have. When I interacted with these people, I realized that I cannot truly empathize with them. Only thing I could do is to imagine. I always try to be honest and authentic、uh, when I create an artwork, so I needed to find my own perspective in this situation. So I decided to make a video that depicts my own privilege and is critical. To those who are being observers, this is how I started to sketch the ideas. I wanted to create a villain who believes that she is a hero. End of November. I already had、uh, the first forty-five seconds of the piece、um, in score form. In my email inbox, and over the next couple weeks, I went over the score and gave Emily some comments about notation and even about instrumentation. At that point, the piece was written for alto saxophone,、um, but it was quite high, and I didn't think it would work exactly as she intended based on the material I was looking at. And after some back and forth, she decided to change it for soprano saxophone. Then I got a new、uh, updated draft,、uh, the first full nine pages of the piece. Which was even more material in mid January. At that point, I went over the score and we did some minor revisions.、Um, and then in July, I received a full, completed draft of the piece. In the summer of 2018, Noah and I met in the Boston suburbs while we were both visiting family to、um, workshop some sketches of the work and to basically work together in person for the first time. It was much easier to workshop in person than over email because we could just talk and discuss things in、uh, real time rather than writing more <laughs> long emails. So that day, Noah played through all the sketches that I had, and we talked through all the things that worked. And well, actually, more of the things that did not work,、um, and then also recorded some cool sounds on the saxophone, like you know, slap tongues, tongue pizzicatos. Breaths and whispers. <gasps> Some of which made its way into the pre-recorded tape part. When the travel ban happened, I felt very voiceless, and in music, voicelessness to me tends to be like. Breaths and noises and sounds that we make when we are not really thinking. Breaths to me are an indication of life, and how one breathes really shows a lot about how one lives. In my head, when I was writing, I heard someone in a dark, echoey room、um, alternating between calm and determined breaths, and also hyperventilating in fear as they, you know, thought through, pondered their life. Their choices and the options that they have ahead of them. In this work, the saxophonist is the protagonist, and throughout the piece, portrays this yo-yo of emotional states. Everything from calm to frenzy,、uh, from uncontrolled to very, very deliberate,、um, placid to livid. Or you know, just dejection to encouragement. It's it's just a piece about contrasts, basically. The electronic part plays a counter protagonist kind of role.、Um, sometimes working in opposition to the live saxophone part, and other times working together. But no matter what this counter protagonist is doing, they are trying to say the same thing,、uh, offering support. But、uh, maybe sometimes saying it in somewhat of a different way. When the whole score was done, I asked Emily to create a MIDI mockup of the whole piece so that I have some reference points for timings and get the overall feel of it. By the time I've pretty much decided that the protagonist in this video will be the balloon girl. As soon as Emily told me that the breath was a key concept in this piece,、um, I wanted to use the balloon as a main symbol. 
In one of my older works, I used balloons to represent breath and life, and I was looking for an opportunity to expand this imagery. Because the music sounded very dramatic, emotional, and intimate, I wanted the video to do the opposite, calm, artificial, and distant, in order to create a dissonance that I felt in me with the reality. Here, the music would be the real feelings that those who suffer or who are threatened by the social political situations are experiencing, but the video is me, who is simply being an observer. So the title of this piece、uh, came to me actually really early on. Unlike many of my works, where I you know spend days after just thinking about the title,、um, here the title is kind of like blocked orders, or you can also read it as blocked borders or locked orders.、Um, it's just a play on words because there's so many meanings、uh, that you can get out of that. And、uh, like the piece, I want people to be able to make their own、uh, understanding or create their own story out of、uh, the piece. So that's why I don't really have a title that actually makes sense. You get to choose what the title really means to you. <laughs> I envisioned the electronics part to be a combination of live and pre-recorded electronics that were to be triggered through a max patch. So I also knew that Noah was going to be running electronics and setting everything up on her own. So I wanted the electronics part to be rather simple. Um, and also not too difficult for me to put together because I know electronics has always been a little bit unpredictable in concert performances, and I've always, well, not always, but often been burned because things just suddenly didn't work. So、uh, in this piece, the electronics part is actually pretty simple.、Um, the live electronics only consists of several effects like harmonizers,、um, various echoes and reverb effects. And panning, so it was actually really simple, but、um, took some time put together as well. Towards the end of finishing up my video, Emily and I talked more often about logistics over Skype. We decided that it would be the easiest if Noah triggers both the electronics and videos simultaneously. So I laid out my videos according to the electronics cues. Where I wanted to start the video a few measures after a cue, I added black screen at the beginning to adjust the timing of the video. Particularly, I was careful that the places where the live electronics happen, the video needed to be somewhat loose with timing, since I cannot know how fast or slow Noah would play in a real performance. On the other hand,、uh, where fixed electronics are happening, I made the timing of the video tighter with the sound materials. In the end, I asked Emily to write in two extra cues where only video happens without electronics. Overall, we tried to minimize cues so that Noah doesn't have to click the foot pedal all the time. So for me, this collaboration was extremely fulfilling. Especially the the back and forth that Emily and I had over the course of many months was just so tedious and not in a bad way. Like we just got so deep into things, not just from a technical standpoint, but also from an artistic standpoint. The great thing is that I felt comfortable making suggestions to her about revisions and about how things could be improved. And she was really happy to hear that from me. I have not always felt comfortable offering that to composers. Not all composers welcome that, but this was such a collaborative project, and I felt like I was really sharing in the ownership of the composition itself, and even of the video. I think there was just so much communication, and that was really the key to success with this project. And from a performer standpoint, what was interesting about this project also was the timing of everything. How I had the score for a while and was working with it in depth, and later got the electronics and had to rethink or reorient myself around the sounds that I was hearing in the electronics and how the electronics were responding to me. Although it ended up being quite a bit of fixed media, but at the same time there was some flexibility. In my own pacing, 
because of where the triggers were, every performance was a little bit different depending on the space and just how I was feeling at the moment. So I, I had that um, opportunity to reinterpret the piece once I got the electronics. And then I also got the video. It did change how I was um, interpreting the music as well. And it changed my, my sense of expression and the, the different characters I was bringing out throughout the piece. And that even changed after the premiere and after further revisions to the electronics. And so those were sort of ongoing conversations that I was having with myself, but also with Emily. And it just was so satisfying to work in that way and be able to have that back and forth and not feel just hindered in any way in communicating with both Emily and Michiko. piece of advice to anybody who want to collaborate with others um, would be to be open. You will get something that's unexpected and then the unexpectedness is the cool thing about collaboration. So you kind of have to be open and accept and see what's going to happen. If there's one thing I would say is um, to be okay with being unsure of what you're doing. And I guess that's very similar uh, with openness, but a lot of times as individual people, we have a style of uh, doing things. But when we bring other people into the creative process, uh, we need to know that that style that we've been used to um, might change. So if you're afraid of change, don't be because know that whoever you're collaborating with will also be there to help you up in case you fall down. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good segue into to my one piece of advice, which is to find people uh, that you can really trust and that you respect and who you know will bring uh, their own passion and dedication to the project as equally as you. I think it really all comes down to finding people you can really truly work with. So... 